Today on America's Test Kitchen, Becky makes Bridget a hearty cauliflower and bean paella. Jack challenges Julia to a taste test of meat-free burgers. Lisa reviews cutting board stabilizers. And Elle makes Julia vegan Baja-style cauliflower tacos. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Today, we are making paella de verduras, which is a vegetable-centric paella that comes from Valencia, Spain. And as Becky's going to show us, it really is all about pulling those vegetables to the front of the recipe, right? That's right. We're going to really showcase those vegetables. Instead of using them to just flavor the rice, they're going to take center stage, and we'll come up with something that is just as satisfying, just as eye-catching as a protein version. Love it. You can make this with a whole lot of vegetables, but we're going to start with cauliflower. Mm. It has a really nice, nutty taste and sort of a crisp, creamy density when it's cooked. It's right. really, really satisfying to eat. We're going to start by heating up the skillet here. I have one and a half tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, and I'm going to do some medium heat. And Paella is traditionally cooked over a live fire on a paella, mm -hmm. which is a wide, shallow skillet. But it's also very common to see stovetop versions. Perfect. So we need two and a half inch to two inch pieces. I like to just kind of dive in there with my fingers. Stalks and florets. Yeah, just a little bit of the stalk. We're going to leave most of the stalk behind here okay. for this recipe because we're really going for something that's super attractive. And if they're hard to pull off, you can just use a little paring knife here. Yeah, sometimes they just don't want to leave that stock. That's right. They don't want to go in my paella. I don't know why. <laughs> it's going to be delicious in there. So we're going for two and a half cups here. And the pieces can be two inches to two and a half inches, something like that. Wow, so they really are quite large, yeah. Nice and chunky here. So we'll call that one cup. We'll get these in. We need one more cup. OK. Quarter teaspoon of salt just to flavor those guys up a little bit. All right. And now we want the cauliflower to get spotty brown. That's going to take three to five minutes. OK. All right, so it's been five minutes. Oh, beautiful. And it wasn't gorgeous already? Oh, gorgeous already. Really nice browning. That's the whole paella. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> what appetit. <laughs> All right, now we're going to be adding some beans. And Valencians would typically add two types of beans to this recipe. They would add the bajoqueta, which is a flat, fresh green bean, kind of like a Romano bean. OK. Yep. And they would add a garafone, which is a fresh shell bean. Now, those are hyper-regional varieties, and we can't find them around here. So we found some nice substitutes. All right. Starting with good old conventional green beans. Runner beans. <laughs> can't go wrong. And they go. That's six ounces, and they're cut in two to two and a half inch pieces. OK. I'm going to add a quarter teaspoon of salt, season those guys up a little bit. And we're going to let this go for another two to four minutes, just until the green beans start to turn dark green. Really developing flavor here. That's right. So it's been like three minutes. The green beans have started to do their thing. They're getting darker and a little bit of browning. So let's transfer them to a bowl here. They can hang out until the next phase. All right. Now I have another one and a half tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Now we're going to build a sofrito. This is where we really start to get in all that layered flavor that makes it so good. And we're going to start with one red bell pepper. That is finely chopped. Yeah, it's nice and chopped. Still medium heat here. All right, I'm also going to add a quarter teaspoon of salt, season that up. And we'll just let this sizzle here for about seven minutes. And we're looking for a little color? A little bit of browning on the okay. pepper. Yep. Smells good. Uh, flavors just keep adding up in here. It's been about seven minutes. You can see they're nicely browned here. So let's start by adding a tablespoon of tomato paste. And we're going to cook that for about a minute. We just want the pepper pieces to get nicely coated here. And that adds really nice umami depth to the sofrito. OK, so here is three garlic cloves minced up. Half a teaspoon of smoked paprika. Other magic ingredient. Yes, love that. And a quarter teaspoon of saffron. Mm. And that just adds that beautiful golden color. And that's the whole paycheck. <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> My treat. <laughs> so just for 30 seconds here until we start to smell that aroma, which I do. That smell is our cue that it's time to keep moving here. This is a quarter cup of dry sherry. Just want to cook that until all the excess moisture evaporates. All right, all of our moisture is just about evaporating. So now it's finally time for the rice. So a cup of rice. You can use calasparra or bamba. Both are really nice Spanish rices. Okay. If you can't find those, it's also okay to use arborio. All right. 
Now we're just gonna stir this for one or two minutes. We want all those grains of rice to get nicely coated in that beautiful sofrito. Mm. Oh yeah. So now we're gonna smooth out that rice in a nice even layer. And now we have butter beans that are gonna go on top. This is our second bean. Remember I mentioned we had the green yes. beans and now this is one can of butter beans that's been drained. You really wanna seek out these butter beans. Their size is perfect for this. You don't wanna use small white beans here. You're going for another ingredient like the cauliflower that is toothsome and meaty. We want some decent sized pieces here. We're not fooling around. This is like the real deal. <laughs> All right, so there's our butter beans and now here's the cauliflower and the green beans that we prepared. Use my hands because I want these to be nicely scattered. Well, it's really interesting how you're layering everything on top of each other. That's right. So now I have three and a half cups of chicken broth. I'm just going to gently pour that in. If you want to make this purely vegetarian, it's fine to use a vegetable broth here, too. All right, so we want the rice to be completely submerged here. I'm going to turn up the heat, bring this up to a boil, and then I'll lower the heat and we'll let this simmer until the liquid is just below the top of the rice. So it's been about 15 minutes and you can see, we're starting to see the rice here kind of poke through that liquid. That's right. It smells amazing. So we're just gonna pop a lid on for five minutes and we're gonna finish cooking that rice all the way through. This is a very fast cooking paella. It is. Yeah. All right, it's been five minutes and you can see our rice is cooked through. Mm, so that steaming also cooked the vegetables through, right? That's right, everything is gonna be just perfecto here. Now we're gonna let it go for another five to seven minutes. We want all of the moisture to evaporate and we wanna to start to hear some popping and sizzling. Mm. That's gonna indicate that the rice on the bottom of the skillet is starting to brown a little bit. That's the best part. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right, we are just about done here. Now we're just gonna make that sokarat, which is the crispy layer of brown rice and the brown proteins and sugars from the cooking liquid that forms on the bottom of the skillet. It is one of the most important parts of a paella. Yes, yes. absolutely. All right, so I finished up that sakarat by rotating the pan a quarter turn for every 20 seconds for about five minutes until it got nice and crusty on the bottom. Mm. Then I slid it off the heat to let it cool down just for five minutes. That's important because the starches in the rice are flexible when they're hot. So when they cool down, they crystallize, they become a little bit more rigid, and that makes the rice nice and crisp and easy to release from the pan. Perfect. Let's just hang on a second. Yeah. This is so vibrant and beautiful. This is a centerpiece. It really is. It really is a it's nice gorgeous. dish. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to taste just as good as it looks. It's beans. Oh, you can see that little bit, the browning of the rice there. See that? Yep. That's our sakarat. That's what we're talking about. You want some of that beautiful cauliflower. Well, first things first. Getting that sakarat. Getting a little bit of that sakarat. Mm. Yeah. Mmm. This is truly one of my all-time favorite vegetarian recipes. I mean, so much depth of flavor, so much complexity. And you know you're talking to me. Yeah, I know who I'm talking to. <laughs> and I gotta say, yes, it happens to be vegetarian, but it's so, so, I mean, just so filling and satisfying. Mm -hmm. With the chunky vegetables. They're not falling apart. The vegetables are not mush. I mean, you look at this bean here inside and it looks meaty and but tender. Mm -hmm. mm. The, the rice is beautifully cooked. Mm -hmm. Full of flavor from that sofrito. Well, thank you, Becky. My pleasure. So if you want to make this a beautiful, vibrant, delicious paella at home, it starts with building flavor right in the skillet. Saute cauliflower and green beans until they're well browned. Use tomato paste to make a savory cooking broth. And top the rice with butter beans and the sauteed vegetables. So from America's Test Kitchen, a truly stupendous and satisfying cauliflower and bean paella. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Where's the sangria? Mm. Now you're talking. <laughs> I am all in when it comes to bean burgers and all the veggie patties you can find at the supermarket, but I am more than a little skeptical of these meatless burgers that pretend to be meat. But today, Jack's gonna walk me through all these options. My goal today is to change your mind. Okay. And I know how difficult that's gonna be because you're not somebody <laughs> easily swayed. I'm not. All right, so there are four meatless burger patties. Some of these came as patties and we cooked them that way. Some of them came as basically a block of ground product that we shaped. <laughs> You almost need a new dictionary for this kind of food. Yeah, I mean, you know, ground plant-based meat, I mean, it's an odd terminology, but I'm gonna tell you 
there's something good on the table. So you dig in. All right. You can tell a lot by looking <laughs> at them raw. Yes, you can. So no surprise, the one that looks like a beef burger mm -hmm. ended up cooking up a lot more like a beef burger. And the one that looks like an old frozen mushroom, it was further away from the real deal. There are four components that I want you to be thinking about. Okay. The first is what's the base? And so it's either soy or pea protein, mm -hmm. wheat gluten, mycoprotein, which is from fungus. The pea and the soy probably do a better job. The second thing is flavors. So there's all kinds of flavors. I think the ones that are trying to replicate the flavor of beef are better than the ones where you can taste carrot or garlic or onion. I mean, I, I like garlic and onion and carrot, but it doesn't really taste like meat. Okay, come on. Like this, how does, how, what, this is supposed to be a burger? It is it a is. burger. <laughs> oh. Is your mind still open here? You didn't say anything about the middle sample. You know what, this has a texture that is very similar to burger. The flavor was fine, it doesn't taste like meat by any stretch, but I love all sorts of bean burgers and veggie patties, and this tastes like a veggie patty, but it has the texture of a burger, and it, so it's, I like it. Okay. I would eat this happily. All right, well, a lot of the texture is how they process it, how they take all these ingredients and then turn them into a patty. So the best ones have coconut oil. Oh, that makes sense. Which is solid at room temperature mm -hmm. and it melts when it's heated and gives you that sort of lusciousness that you get from a beef burger. Mm -hmm. The last thing is how they replicate looking like meat. Mm -hmm. And so some of them use pomegranate juice, beet juice, heme protein. So they basically extracted from soybean plant roots something that is very similar to the hemoglobin that's in beef. Hmm. And really is giving you this appearance not only when it's raw, but when it's cooked. If you cook it too rare, it's pink in the middle. Now, can you undercook these and like cook them medium rare? Or do you really have to cook them all the way through? You want to get a crispy exterior because I think that's you want them browned. Mm -hmm. But if you want a well done burger, make it well done. I think they're better cooked to somewhere around the 130. So. All right, well these are very different right yeah. off the bat. These two definitely taste like veggie patties. I mean, the texture is of a veggie patty, the flavor is a veggie patty. This one is just really unappealing. I mean, the texture, the flavor, the size, the thickness. This one I could easily make fun of, but there's something about it I like. It tastes like a veggie patty, but there's a nice flavor in there. I love the browning and crisp on the outside. It would be a lovely, it'd be a lovely dinner, but it doesn't taste like meat. Okay. So these two are really approaching meat. They're not there, but you know, enough ketchup and mustard and pickles and tomatoes and a good brioche bun. I don't think I'd be fooled, but I'd be happy. Uh, and I will tell you with the better ones that I've done a lot of cooking with these recently, tacos mm. and other things where you start using bigger flavors. Honestly, it gets really difficult to tell the difference because the texture is so close and there's mm -hmm. no flavor that screams not beef. This one, I like the texture a bit better. It's a okay. bit more like beef. But there's something about this one I really appreciate. Um, it doesn't have a strong flavor one way or the other. It almost tastes a little on the sausage side, but I like that. I think if you're looking for a really good replacement for beef, this is the closest, I would think. This is not far behind, though, in terms of flavor. Let's start with what you liked best. You can flip over the cards. So you chose the runner-up, mm. which we recommended, the Beyond Meat, Beyond Burger. So they have two products. This is the one that's sold already in a patty form, so they call it uh, burger. The other one that has beef at the end of the name was sold in a brick, uh, gotcha. like a ground uh, meat. So the winner's down on the end. So this is the impossible. This is the one with the heme. It's pretty close. And yeah. when you start putting any seasoning in this, other than salt and pepper, which is really mm -hmm. all you've got, you, you really get pretty close to beef. So let's take a look at the things you were less enthusiastic about. This one. Yeah, so this is Morningstar Farms. Mm -hmm. This was not recommended. It was better than some of the other not mm -hmm. recommended. I mean, you found a little bit to like about it, mm -hmm. but it's not that close to beef. Mm -mm. And at the very end, this is the Gardein, bottom of the rankings. It's too thin, it's too wispy, it's not really beefy, <laughs> it's not no. that close to meat. Thanks, Jack. You're welcome, Julia. So there you go. If you're ready to enter the world of meat-free burgers, check out Impossible Foods Impossible Burger, which costs about $10 for a 12-ounce package. Even the best cutting boards slip around sometimes, and that's why we tested cutting board stabilizers. Now you can always use a wet paper towel or a dish towel under the boards, but these gadgets could be easier and they could let us skip the soggy countertop. We tried five models, a set of these clip-on feet and four mats. 
They're priced from about $3 to around $41. And we use them to stabilize wood and plastic boards on all different types of counters. The bad news, these silly little feet called the Dream Farm Chobs, they're super tight and hard to put on. And even once you get them on, it's a problem. They raise the board up too high, so it's like a trampoline when you're chopping. Look at this. Forget it. Now, some of these mats were too thick or too narrow, so we had a board that rocked back and forth. And cleaning some of these, totally annoying. This one's like a grippy Lego surface, and we were picking parsley off it forever, even after it went through the dishwasher. Our favorite was the Architect Smart Mat. Now, this did a great job of keeping cutting boards of all materials from sliding around on all types of counters. And because it's made up of these little rings, it was pretty easy to clean. It's thin, it's flexible, so it's simple to store. And if you've never used a cutting board stabilizer, you should. It feels great and so secure. And at just under $16, it's a relatively small price to pay to never have to worry about your cutting board slipping ever again. Cauliflower is having its day and being used as the main ingredient in all sorts of recipes, from pizza, buffalo bites, to tacos, which is what Elle is going to show us how to make today. Yep, and we're going to start with a bed of crunchy slaw, mm. and it is store-bought. But before we get started, I'm going to do some prep. Okay. So this slaw calls for half a mango. I'm only going to peel half because I'm only going to use half. Well, that's clever. Keep yeah. the other half for something else. That's right. Keep the peel on so it doesn't brown. I'm always a little careful here so I don't cut into the core mm -hmm. too much. Oh, I hit it. That's okay. I'm going to go around. So I'm mm -hmm. just going to go around and get this meat off, okay? Nice done. Yeah. All right, and I'm just going to cut this in two quarter inch pieces. All right, I'm going to go straight into the bowl with this. So now we need about a tablespoon of jalapeno pepper. I'm going to cut it down the middle. Like to quarter it. It makes taking the ribs and seeds out a lot oh, easier. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. So once I take the ribs and seeds out, I'm going to dice it. But if you like it spicy, like I know you do, you can keep the ribs and the seeds. So I'm going to cut it into just some matchstick pieces because I'm going to mince it. The smaller you get it to start, the easier the mince is. So I'm going to need about a tablespoon of that. There we go. I'm going to now add three tablespoons of lime juice a tablespoon of cilantro chopped, some salt and some pepper. The mango and the jalapeno are gonna give it an amazing sweet heat combination. I love that combo. And I like that it start with a store-bought base, but then you gussy it up and it doesn't take much and it saves you so much work. And look what we got. It's giving summer vibes. <laughs> it's giving all the summer vibes. Well, it's gonna taste good in a taco. Oh yeah. All right, so that's all set. I'm gonna put it aside. Now we're gonna make our cilantro sauce. Okay. Okay, so we're starting with a quarter cup of vegan mayo. Vegan, so these are vegan tacos. Yes, I think you'll like it. We have a quarter cup of dairy-free sour cream. And vegan sour cream's textures vary depending on the brand. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so we have some water here so that we can create the texture that we want. I'm gonna add three tablespoons. Okay. Okay, and to that I'm gonna add also three tablespoons of minced cilantro, because it is a cilantro sauce. <laughs> and a quarter teaspoon of salt. And we're just gonna whisk it. Super simple sauce. This is the texture that you want, mm -hmm. right? This is the thickness. Now, if you had some other sour cream, it may be thicker, and you can just add a tablespoon of water at a time till you reach a consistency you like. Okay, so the sauce is done. Just a couple more steps before we start cooking tacos. Okay. All right. Sauce, slaw, check. Yes, batter. Uh -huh. Most important. Okay. Okay. And this is the batter that's going to coat the cauliflower. Absolutely. So what we need is something to make it crunchy. And we have a cup of unsweetened coconut flakes. And I'm going to put it in a shallow dish. We have a cup of panko. Okay. Equal amounts. Yep. And I'm just going to just use my hand to kind of give this a good mix. There we go. I think that looks good. Now the second part is a wet batter because we need to make the panko actually stick to the cauliflower. So to do that, I have a cup of coconut milk here because we want to keep the flavor profile consistent. Coconut milk also has a really nice viscosity that will coat the cauliflower without running off. Yes. I got a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper, a teaspoon of garlic powder, 
a teaspoon of cumin, and a teaspoon of salt. Just give it a good whisk. All right, we have everything we need. We got a dry batter, we have a wet batter. Let's clean up so we can make some tacos. All right. Okay, Julia, so we have the star of the show, leg cauliflower. <laughs> this is half a head of cauliflower, mm -hmm. about one pound, cut into one inch florets. I'm gonna add it to our wet batter. I love cauliflower, Me actually, too. because it's so versatile, right? Mm -hmm. It takes on any flavor profile you tell it to. I'm just gonna toss them and make sure that they all get coated with our wet batter, right? Because that's the important part of making our crunchy exterior. All right, so that looks pretty well tossed. So now this part takes a little bit of time because you have to do it like one cauliflower <laughs> at a time, right? But it will be worth it in the end. It will totally be worth it. All right, it's also important to let any excess batter drip back into the bowl. Well, it's pretty fast to get up to this point. I think so, and it's not a huge amount, and I think it's worth the work. So I have here a rimmed baking sheet. I sprayed it with some cooking spray, very simple prep. And I'm just gonna put my cauliflower there on the sheet. We're gonna do this for each and every one. So I'm just gonna like take my tongs and kind of cover some and press it down. Look. Oh, get it all up into yeah. the base. That's right. Cause it's crunch and it's flavor. We are not playing around. Okay, Julia, so we are finishing our very last cauliflower. I have the oven set at 450 degrees and the rack is in the middle position. We're gonna let it cook for 20 to 25 minutes. At 10 minutes, we're gonna check it and then we'll rotate the pan mm -hmm. and then we'll have tacos. Okay, it's been like 20 minutes. Oh, that toasted coconut smell. It smells amazing. It does. Yeah. Here, right. I get to do it for you. Thank you. Look at that. Oh. They're golden, mm -hmm. crisp, ready to eat. Okay, I'm gonna start with a little of our slaw. When I love that you toasted the corn tortillas, oh, that little bit of char on it. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be so great with this slaw we made. Let's get you a couple of good crunchy pieces. I'm gonna sauce it up for you. You know I how to build a taco. Wow. Mm, gorgeous. Mmm. I am not vegan, but I will happily eat this anytime. The crunch. Mm-hmm. The sweet. A little bit of kick of fresh cilantro. Yes. And I love that coconut flavor. It just adds a little bit more oomph to the cauliflower. L, these tacos are fantastic. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You want to make these killer vegan tacos. Start by making a simple lime-flavored slaw and creamy cilantro sauce. Coat the cauliflower with a combination of shredded coconut and panko, then roast them in a hot oven before assembling it all into warm corn tortillas. From America's Test Kitchen, a brand new recipe for vegan Baja style cauliflower tacos. You can get this recipe and all the recipes and product reviews from this season, along with selected episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com slash TV. I'm gonna need you to make me another one. <laughs>